evening, and welcome to the Easton Film Festival Presents. I'm Lauren Swartz, your hostess, and I want to thank you for inviting me into your home this evening, hopefully to talk about something that you like, which is filmmaking um, and, and film watching, and that's what the Easton Film Festival is all about. We sponsor uh, many activities and events in the town of Easton um, for lovers of film, uh, watchers of film, and makers of film. The um, uh, the purpose of this show is to highlight the filmmakers who are your neighbors, your friends, the talent that is actually here in Easton. And through the four years of existence in the film festival, we have discovered many talents and many um, outlets for um, creative expression. And that's what our show hopes to do. The film festival sponsors many events um, during the course of the year for you to get involved and for you to um, discover your love of filmmaking. Uh, one of our events is the film, uh, film Club, which is uh, bi-monthly at Andrews Bakery, which is across from the main entrance of Stonehill College on Belmont Street. And every other Friday night at 7 o'clock, we uh, show free of charge a um, uh, Hollywood film. This year we're exposing, uh, exposing, examining the directors, American directors, um, Ford, um, let's see, William Wyler, we've looked at Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, we look at four, uh, four of their films, uh, each director, uh, over the course of, of the Friday evenings. And uh, then after the film is shown, uh, we'll sit and discuss it and uh, talk about important elements, why it was a film of note. Uh, the films have all been chosen by uh, Ed Hand, who's a teacher over at Oliver Ames. And uh, we've really enjoyed uh, increased participation this year, and it's a great way to spend a Friday evening right here in town. The um, uh, Film Festival Committee also sponsors our annual film competition, which is uh, accepts submissions in May for judging and then awards at our FE uh, ceremony in June um, at Stonehill College. We award uh, cash prizes in three categories, uh, drama, documentary, and uh, original music video. So please, if you have uh, any interest, look on our website, eastonfilmfestival.com, for more information, uh, an entry form, because uh, now is the time to start working on your your film and your ideas because the cash prizes are uh, provided um, gratefully from the Northeastern Savings Bank who's been a sponsor of the film festival from the very beginning. So uh, this is no um, small peanuts here in town these days. The competition gets very heated. Uh, we also do have an opportunity for you to uh, see the films, uh, all of the films that are submitted so that you as, as the audience can judge and see ahead of time what we um, as the festi festival committee gets to enjoy as well. So um, it, um, as a sidelight to our annual competition, this year we have um, begun our film jams. And film jams are actually a, a nationwide movement in communities that um, have film clubs like ours where um, teams get together for a weekend competition to produce a five-minute film. Um, you draw a genre out of a hat, uh, a genre being uh, a type of film, historical fiction, comedy, drama, um, along those lines. And then you draw out of a separate hat a line of dialogue from a, f a famous line of dialogue that you must incorporate into your film. So uh, it is a lot of fun. There's a lot of creativity. Uh, teams have a great time. We just had one that had 15 teams. Uh, so it has grown by leaps and bounds. And um, many of the film jam uh, submissions will also be shown here on this uh, station because it's just so much fun to see what your friends and your neighbors are doing. So I encourage you to keep an eye out in the film jam as well. Uh, and the final way that you can be involved, of course, is, is by watching this show, which I thank you for. What we have been doing this year with our filmmakers series is examining the films that have been submitted in any of these venues and talking about some of their techniques uh, to help hopefully educate you at home and inspire you to go home, um, put together a script, think of some clever costumes or not, or, or sounds or music or something that inspires you to make a film. Because you never know uh, where you're going to end up. Uh, those film aficionados out there among us will recognize that Steven Spielberg, who is a pretty well-known name in film land these days, uh, did start out small like this as a teenager. And we have many young adults who are um, uh, putting together very creative works of art. Um, what we have done tonight is gone into our Easton Film Festival archives uh, way back when. This one got overlooked somehow, but it was found by my producer, Bill Ames. And we'd like to show it to you tonight because it is really a fine piece of work 
by a young man who, um, at the time that he submitted the film, um, had just graduated from uh, UMass Boston and had submitted several uh, short films in various film festivals around. Um, in fact, and what he wrote in his uh, bio for his submission for this film was that his most recent work was a film called Star Time that was shown in four different film festivals and most recently uh, at the un Boston Underground Film Festival. So um, we are um, the hotbed of a lot of excitement in filmmaking and our show hopefully will encourage some of you at home to do this as well. So uh, Michael Johnson has put together this documentary um, of which we're going to look at a few clips first then we'll see the complete piece of work. Um, the reason we look at a few clips is to take out some of the elements that are very important and crucial to a successful um, a film. So um, Rich Hudson of Hudson Photography here in Easton ha helps us in the studio pull out uh, some pieces that uh, you and I can look at together. So we're going to go ahead and look at our first clip from uh, Michael's uh, documentary called Heavy. And I'm not going to say anything more about it. We're going to look at this clip and talk about some of the elements first. Okay. Since the beginning, pretty much. How long has that been when the band stopped? Uh, well, we, we've been playing, us four together, been playing for about, Christ, has it been two years? A little over two years, maybe? Yeah, us four. Who else is in the band? Uh, Jim, Jeff, and Norm. I really wanted to sing, and uh, we couldn't find really anybody, so I said, <clears throat> might as well try, uh, singing and we know that Jim played the drums because Jeff jammed with them in the time that we weren't all playing together. Yeah. Okay, so here we see uh, oh, so many elements. It's, there's, it's gritty, it's, it's black and white, it's um, underground kind of feel to it. It's very um, uh, avant-garde style. Here we have an interview face on, okay, um, that's, there's a little bit of smoke drifting across. There's some very quick cuts to characters that he mentions, uh, you know, a name, a name, a name. And you see that shot, that shot, that shot, very quickly. Um, this, is, this is raw. This is um, from the gut. This is what people um, who watch MTV and all of those um, uh, shows now that are very mainstream, very up and coming, art school style kinds of things are working on. So here we have something, and this is you know, uh, uh, obviously a student of film, but not complicated for somebody at home to do. To shoot black and white, it's it's not, it, it, it's either color black and white, but yet the image that you convey by a black and white or a sepia tone is a completely different one than color, because now you're focusing on the person, the subject, the, the grittiness, the rawness of it, as opposed to how colorful it is and how much movement and how magical color can be. So that sets a tone right away. Um, the the um, documentary is about a band. You're expecting music, you're expecting that kind of stuff. What you're hearing is dialogue, you're hearing emotions, you're hearing um, uh, basically a band when they're not singing. So you're seeing behind the scenes. And that's something that everybody loves to see when uh, you're watching uh, any sort of film. You like to know what's going on behind the scenes. What is, what are they thinking about and what are they, what is driving them to do what they do? Uh, in this case, be in a rock band. So I think with this um, quick view of what he's put together, I think he's done an excellent job of setting a, a very important tone with um, uh, just, you know, uh, un, unadulterated, unmusical dialogue. Uh, it's not, you know, obviously there's not attention to costuming, however, this is how they look. This is what a rock band looks like. So whether they planned it or not, this is who they are. And this is what you're seeing. And when you're a filmmaker, you get to pick and choose what elements you want to, to show to your audience. And be very aware that what they're wearing, how they're speaking, um, how they move in a shot is all the opportunity that you have to, to get your point across. So be very careful what you're showing and be you know, very cognizant of what you're editing out. Uh, those are very important elements. So uh, I think this clip was a great way to see a few very important elements um, very quickly that are telling a story. You and I want to see what else they're going to talk about because I'm not a rock band fan, but I do want to see how troubled they are or how successful they are. 
So I want to watch more of this. So let's go ahead and take a look at our second clip and we'll talk about it afterwards. Heavy groove. That's about all I can describe it as. Who writes the songs in the band? Do you, do you all write together or is it just one person? Or? Well, that's funny because we're writing, <laughs> writing right now. Uh, usually Keith and Jeff make something up. They tell Jim to put a drum beat over it, and then they tell me to write words to it. It takes Noam about a month and a half to write lyrics for the song. Does it really take that long for a song? It takes a long time. We had probably six, seven songs written. So now here we have continuing the ed our education of how this rock band um, moves with some personal interviews, um, unadulterated, unadorned, uh, there's no music behind, but then we have some very quick concert footage. So um, the editing is, is crucial in maintaining our interest in this area, and you can see excellent examples just now, uh, as well as, uh, you know, personal interviews. Again, continuing this very um, uh, informal, uh, gritty, uh, you know, rock band, underground kind of, of mood that they're conveying. Um, it's all staying in the same, uh, you know, line of emotion, and yet by talking to some of these people, their cause is becoming real to you. And as a filmmaker, you are able to engage your audience in, in various ways, but you have to be able to um, transform that uh, you know to your vision so here we have you know rock band and they're going to engage a middle-aged woman like me or somebody's grandma well what they're going to do is they're going to talk about how hard it is to do their job or how much they mess up or how much they argue or whatever this is the kind of stuff that people want to hear we want it we don't want to hear necessarily the loud music we want to hear what's going on so you have a choice as a filmmaker in uh, looking at your interviews in deciding what you want to tell people because it's got to be of interest to them uh, to continue watching. It's obviously of interest to you, but why is it interesting to you as a filmmaker and can you convey that to your audience? So this was an exa ex excellent example of, of how um, Michael is, is showing his interest in this subject and he's making you interested in it because he's just showing you know, real people and he's not making it loud and he's not making it you know, lots of stuff flashing at you or whatever else, you know, he could make those decisions of. So um, here we've looked at a couple of, of clips and um, elements that he as a filmmaker chose. Uh, we're looking at a lack of color, so we're doing black and white. or had a little bit of smoke filtering in there um, to that first clip. We've had some very quick cuts. We've had some long cuts. We've had some voiceovers. We've had some quick concert stage footage um, for background. Uh, all of these different things are uh, a part of this documentary. Um, so I think Michael has, is able to tell you and show you, uh, even though you're not a, a professional, a semi-professional photographer or filmmaker like he is, that it's not complicated for you to be able to do it, but you have to make some clear decisions and make some choices about your editing, make some choices about um, your setting, uh, about your um, sound choices, and uh, in that way, you'll be able to have a documentary that's going to reach um, multi-aged and multi-generational people. So I think what I'd like to do now, because I've, I've had enough of a teaser myself in watching these clips, is, is go ahead and let's go ahead and run the, oh, we have, oh I have a, I'm sorry, we have a third clip, my producer just told me, um, third clip to look at it. Um, to really get us uh, into the elements that he uh, has put together. So let's go ahead and take a look at our third clip. We'll come back and talk about it afterwards. It's like a physical injury, which is not going to allow me to. But I'm going to keep playing as long as I can. Where I want to be in five years and where, I, where I'll probably be in five years are two totally different things. So I really don't know. I mean, if you ask me where I'd be five years from now, the last thing I thought I'd be doing would be talking into this camera, you know? So go figure. In a band, big or not, I'm going to be still playing in a band, um, doing artwork for a band. I something to do with the music industry. I know that for a fact. To be a musician, to to have people 
just having your stuff and just being in love with, with what you've done is, is, is just a, an awesome feeling. You know, if, if someone could look at me the way I look at, you know, Randy Rhodes or Ozzy Osbourne or Dimebag or Zach and, you know, I don't know what I'd do if someone ever felt that way about me. It's, I, I, it's almost unbelievable. Like, I can't even imagine what that must feel like. But hopefully someday somebody will. Okay, so this third clip, um, the thing that I guess I am uh, most enjoy bringing to note is his various choices of lighting and camera angles. Uh, when he's having uh, the individual interviews, that first interview, the camera's very close. You're very close up to the speaker. Um, uh, it's almost an unnatural angle, a little below him. Um, that's something to note because the person is, there's a different image um, uh, conveyed as opposed to the, the second and third interviews which are basically head-on but note how the lighting affects how you view those particular interviews. First interview is a little little intimidating because it's a little bit of an upshot and it's and it's very uh, dramatic lighting. The second interview also dramatic lighting. There's heavy shadow on his face. There's a lot of hesitation in his his language so you're just kind of waiting for the next words to come out. And then the third interview there's a lot more light. Um, it's still uh, just a headshot in conversation, but it's he's friendlier. You just see him as friendly because of that lighting. So these, this was a great example of um, giving you uh, three different perspectives, showing the importance of lighting uh, and the interview process in a documentary. The, um, the other thing that you should note from these three clips is also the timing of the speakers Sometimes you'll have people who talk and, uh, 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 and there's a lot of hesitation. You don't necessarily want that in a clip. However, the filmmaker used in this instance, that, that length of hesitation and, and indecision as uh, this was all ad lib. This is very much off the cuff and very casual. And again, you are involved. You are not watching a scripted thing. You are actually yourself asking this guy why do you do this why do you like it how hard is this to do that um, this is why you want to watch the rest of this film and then we see the concert footage the lighting is still uh, you know it's it's dark uh, the stage is lit the audience is a little that's what you would see uh, you know in the audience yourself so why don't we go ahead and watch the entire work this is called heavy by Michael Johnson and based on the band last step go ahead why not? We got just as much of a chance of doing it as anybody else, you know? Bands coming out all the time. People like music, you know, and if you're different, you're fresh, and you're in the right place at the right time, why not, you know? That's the way I see it. So what's your name? I am Keith from Last Step. And what are you doing Last Step? Play guitar. How long have you been in the band? Since the beginning, pretty much. How long has that been when the band stopped? Uh, well, we we've, we've been playing us four together. Been playing for about Christ. Has it been two years? A little over two years, maybe. Yeah, us four. Who else is in the band? Uh, Jim, Jeff, and Norm. I really wanted to sing, and uh, we couldn't find really anybody. So I said, <clears throat> might as well try uh, singing and we know that Jim played the drums because Jeff jammed with him in the time that we weren't all playing together and uh, so we called him up he came down started playing I started singing and uh, that's basically when it really really started you like playing bass uh, it's better than any instrument that you see in this room so why why do you think that is Cause it's just awesome awesome it's better than guitar Guitars are a dime a dozen. Drums, too hard to play. I mean, you gotta use all four limbs. Bass, I mean, you got four, eight, six, twelve string basses, but just come on balls to it. You get deeper sound, you get different tones and mid ranges. Guitar, you get all highs and ugh. Stayed after school later than normal one day and, yeah. Uh, I was walking down through the through the corridor and I heard a bunch of banging going down downstairs in the music room. So I went downstairs in the music room and saw a couple of kids taking lessons from one of the teachers and they were practicing the drums and I said, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. How would you describe your music? 
Oh, uh, I don't know. Everybody always asks us that, and I never have an answer for it. Heavy. It's it's different. It's heavy. Heavy groove. That's about all I can describe it as. Who writes the songs in the band? Do you, do you all write together, or is it just one person? Or well, that's funny because we're writing, <laughs> writing right now. Uh, usually, Keith and Jeff make something up. They tell Jim to put a drum beat over it, and then they tell me to write words to it. it takes Noam about a month and a half to write lyrics for the song. Does it really take that long for a song? It takes a long time. We had probably six, seven songs written without lyrics. And he finally wrote lyrics to three of them. Then we wrote a new song probably like a month and a half ago. And he finally finished the lyrics to them. My philosophy is if we don't write it in one practice, it's never gonna, it's never gonna happen. We've spent weeks and weeks and weeks working on two riffs, trying to make them into a song, and they just <clears throat> just don't come together. I don't know how other bands write, I really don't ask, but uh, it's worked so far for us. They're really pushing for me to uh, to write the words and they'll do something with it, but I don't know, I've been, I've been having a hard time lately. What's it like playing live? I love it. I I get excited every time. Every time we get ready for a show, I'm always excited and I'm running around. Everybody always says, everybody, well, everybody always makes fun of me because every time before a show, like, we'll start loading up and everything. And everyone's like, okay, we're ready to go. And I'm like, I'm starving. I need to get something to eat. It's because I get all nervous and everything. And I start getting hungry. And even when we, when we get to the show, like, like for about half an hour before we go on, I'm so excited to play. I just, I'll, I'll, I just, I don't know what to do. I'm walking back and forth. And I start drinking water. And then I have to go to the bathroom like 15 times. And it's, but it's a great feeling. I love getting up there and just having everybody watch you just, just play your music. It's like you don't need you don't need a psychiatrist, somebody to tell you problems to, you know what I mean? You just need to get up on a stage and scream them at about 200 people or 10 people or 5 people or whoever decides to show up and there's nothing they can really do about it. They have to listen to it, you know? So you're trying to be a cop? Yeah, don't tell anybody. You'll ruin my rep. Heavy metal madman goes, goes to law enforcement. Yes, I am actually in the police academy as we speak, but... Hopefully I will be signed and famous for I have to bite the bullet and start working a 12 to 8 shift. But so, yeah, that's that's the plan. Copper rock star, go figure. Actually, I went to law enforcement school with Keith and he was playing guitar then too and I thought it was kind of weird because I thought I was the only musician that went to school basically, you know what I mean? Because usually they're the druggies and the sitting at home playing their guitar. And But I don't, I don't think it's weird, I mean society's changing i mean there's a lot of there's probably a lot of cops out there that that are in bands that that they just don't want people to know either cover bands blues bands whatever there's a lot of people i work with now that i wouldn't even think that they're in a band two of them are singers one of them's a drummer i would never even ex like ex expect it from them where do you see yourself five ten years from now personally or band wise you like both either i really don't know I really could. That's that's the question. That was funny because when we were talking about this whole interview thing, that was the question that I was like, he's going to ask, and I have no idea. Five or ten years from now. Are you all right with that? Having no idea, just being like, are you like, does it worry does, you? Or does just... anybody have an idea that like, where are you going to be five, five or ten years from now? You know, it's when you're on the other end, it's a different story. You know, um, five or ten years from now, I'd love to be last step as a career. You know what I mean? So that's your definite goal then to be in a band and be a successful band, and that's your goal. That would be the ultimate for you. That would be that would I'd be satisfied. That would be my that would probably be the greatest thing. I hope we all just evolve together and just stay together and just keep playing the same type of music and hopefully get a lot bigger by then. But you'll always be in a band, either this band or another I, band. You think? You I hope so. Band? I hope I am. I hope I'm not to the point where my knees are breaking or my elbows are breaking and I can't play because that's probably going to be the one thing that stops me is like a physical injury which is not going to allow me to but I'm going to keep I'm going to keep playing as long as I can where I want to be in five years and where I where I'll probably be in five years are two totally different things so 
I really don't know. I mean, if you asked me where I'd be five years from now, the last thing I thought I'd be doing would be talking into this camera, you know? So, go figure. In a band, big or not, I'm gonna be still playing in a band. Um, doing artwork for a band. I had something to do with the music industry. I know that for a fact. To be a musician, to, to have people just having your stuff and just being in love with, with what you've done is, is, is just a, an awesome feeling. You know, if, if someone could look at me the way I look at, you know, Randy Rhodes or Ozzy Osbourne or Dimebag or Zach and, you know, I don't know what I do if someone ever felt that way about me. It's, I, I, it's almost unbelievable. Like, I can't even imagine what that must feel like. But hopefully someday somebody will. I like documentaries, I think, um, more because they teach me something new about other people. Um, dramas are nice, but in this documentary, I think there were so many elements that Michael Johnson was able to show us. Um, and for you as a filmmaker to look at these elements, or as somebody who's hoping to make a film for our competitions this year, um, the pace of this documentary, the, educate, the, the way he educated us, the um, elements he put in were all very painstakingly thought out. Uh, we have initially, what is this group? Who are the people putting it together? Why do they do it? What do they love about it? Why is it their passion? How it's been going along? And then we have a closure kind of a tone set. And then, of course, the, the, um, the appendix, so to speak, or the epilogue, where you're hearing, the, you read on the titles that the band broke up and this are the people that were in there. So I think that uh, this is an excellent example of, of timing, of script work, of some, uh, some key camera cuts that are put in. We have some excellent concert footage put in um, with um, some overdubbing of how they're writing, how they have ideas, some of their challenges. I happen to love that technique. And I happen to love when um, I'm hearing more about people uh, for example, this, the gentleman who wants to, who is in the police academy, and yet he doesn't look like he's in the police academy. He's in a rock band. Um, these kind of surprise elements in a documentary, something that you didn't think you were going to find out, something that you didn't think you were going to learn. That's what makes a powerful documentary. Um, the surprise element. I mean, any film, documentary, drama, anything. When there's a surprise element or something new, and the audience goes, "Whoa, that was neat," or "This is so cool," or that kind of stuff. Um, that's what you need to think of. You have to have your hook, you have to have your, uh, your little specialness about it. And I think uh, Mr. Johnson does a great job with um, uh, the techniques that he showed in this illustration of, of a rock band, Last Step. So I'm so glad he submitted this a couple of years ago. Uh, it was in our archives and I'm happy to be able to show it to you now as a way of illustrating some techniques and some decisions that you can make when you're putting together a documentary. A film, so uh, t you know to be aware of all those elements uh, is very crucial, and we're looking forward to seeing what you can um, put up for us at either our film jam or at our annual competition. So, on behalf of the festival committee, I want to say good night. I'm Lauren Swartz. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to um, the Northeastern Savings Bank and to Comcast Studios Nine, to, to Clearpoint Communications for our website, and we'll see you uh, same time next week. Good night.